Hey there, welcome to Farmcraft. I'm John, and this, this is a 1975 Cat D3, and um, you know, I might have paid too much for it. I don't know. So I looked for a very long time for a dozer, and I did not want to get one that was just a basket case full of problems. I want one that I can use without too much work. Now this does have some issues, but for the most part, it's functional. It'll run, it'll push, the blades move, you know, the undercarriage is in pretty good shape, the grousers aren't all worn flat. After looking for many months, this one went up for sale, and I snatched it up. I had had several that had gotten sold out from under me when I was looking at them. So why do I think I might have paid too much? Well, one reason in particular. I mean, it has problems, those were obvious. Like, some of the cylinders, the chrome's gone there, but this cylinder isn't leaking. Both sides, uh, these cylinders, which raise and lower the blade, they're both leaking quite a bit. And the one on the opposite side, I'll show you in a minute, it, it needs a new rod. So I knew that, that was obvious. The undercarriage actually looks pretty good. The chain, the pins aren't terribly worn, a little bit. And all of the wheels turn. I did notice that the tracks are on there a little tight. I don't know if they had an issue with it throwing tracks so they tightened it down more or if they just didn't know it's not supposed to be that tight. We'll have to look at all that. Same on this side, everything turned. This cylinder leaks. You can see there it needs a new rod. And there's a couple nicks on these cylinder rods down here too, but they're not leaking. This probably won't be a big deal, but you know, this is, they call it the governor, but basically it's your throttle. And it doesn't want to stay put while you're, while you're using it. You almost have to hold that in position. So I'm going to need to do some work on that. So this has been sitting here for a while because I've been into other things. One of the first things I did was take the battery out of it. Reason for that is he told me that if you leave the battery connected, it'll kill it. So it must have a parasitic draw somewhere. They had a battery kill switch here, but if you look under there, it looks like it got melted at some point. So I don't think that switch is going to be functional. So I want to check that out. Um, I got to get the battery back in it. We'll pull it over to the shop and we'll start digging through this thing. So to answer the question of why I might have paid too much, it's behind this panel. Um, I checked this thing out really well. I, I went to the place, I looked under it before we started it and operated it. We operated it for a while, I let it sit and I looked under it again. There wasn't any significant leaks seen. The only, only thing I saw was this, you know, which leaks down onto there. After it got here though, unfortunately, there's a pretty sizable leak right behind here and right behind here is the hydraulic pump. So if I have to put a new hydraulic pump on this thing, that's gonna stink. But hopefully it'll just be, you know, maybe a hose or a loose fitting. Man, that would be nice. Just tighten up a fitting. I honestly don't know. And um, I've never even uh, gotten a, the tools out to take these panels off and really check this thing out. I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but uh, I showed up to look at it. Didn't realize I was going to need a tool kit. I guess I should have known that for a dozer. And um, yeah, I kind of had to look in as best I can at the things that I could access and you just can't see much under there. Now I can tell you, a guy who I know who is very experienced with dozers told me this was a $20,000 machine when I, when I sent him the link before I went and bought it. And um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I trust him, but the part of me just says $20,000 for a 1975 dozer, that's insane. But um, I don't know, maybe that's just what they cost and I'm a cheapskate, but I feel like 15 was high. That remains to be seen though. If, if it's not a big deal under there and all I have to do is fix a few cylinders and then I've got a functional dozer, I'll be happy with the 15. That's kind of what I thought I was doing. Oh, that is a heavy battery. I'm gonna check something here. Let's put this thing on amps. I'm assuming the current isn't too big. Hopefully I'm not going to fry my meter here. Well, that's not much. It's four milliamps. I mean, maybe the guy just wasn't using it many months at a time in between uses. That would, that would add up, but no reason I can't leave that battery hooked up for a little while. Assuming it's charging. Let's 
So left side is your gears and your throttle. There's also a safety handle there. And then you can see it says off there. So that's no throttle, that's full throttle. And that thing just moves way too easy. When this thing's vibrating, it won't stay at full throttle. These are your gears. That's in neutral there. You've got reverse first, second, and third. So in other words, that would be first, that's second, that's third. And then just one reverse speed. And over here, you've got your blade controls, blade up, down. I forget which is which. One of these is to tilt left and right, and then the other one is to angle left and right. We've got a water temp gauge. Is it oil pressure? I think that's oil pressure. An hour meter that doesn't work unless this thing has zero hours on it. Uh, amp gauge. Oh, I think that's the transmission oil sensor. And it does have glow plugs, so you turn and hold if you want to uh, preheat with glow plugs. That would be doing the glow plugs. And look, the amp meter works. This is a foot controlled steering. So you've got your two steering clutches. So that will break the right track and that will break the left track. And that's gonna take me some getting used to because I've never driven anything like that before. But in other words, if you wanna turn to the right, you push the right, it stops this track and the left track will come around and then vice versa. This center brake just stops the machine. All right, let's see if this thing will start up without any, uh, any preheating. Hmm. It's got fuel. I, I can see the, uh, the smoke going through the exhaust. Let it sit for a minute. I'll give it another try. I may need to do some preheating pretty warm out here I would think it maybe wouldn't need it but you know all right let's glow plug it It's only three inches, but that'll make me a lot happier underneath that thing. We're gonna be changing oil and everything. All right, we are gonna cut right to the chase and see where this thing's leaking from. And you can see the cylinder, it leaks a lot. So this is what I'm seeing. I mean, there's definitely some oil here, but I don't see it dumping. Maybe it was coming from the cylinder. Why didn't I just use my lift? <laughs> There's no chance that lift could pick this thing up. Might break my lift. I'm glad I'm not just a little bit taller because I can walk underneath these and it clears up the space down here so it's easier to get through. This is the hydraulic pump, 
which, you know, I'm used to thinking like on an excavator, your hydraulic pump is everything. It runs every operation on the machine. But in this, it's only running the blade. The rest of it is steering clutches that are coming straight off a drive shaft from the engine. So it's kind of a little pump. So if I ever had to replace that, I mean, I'm sure it wouldn't be cheap, but it wouldn't be, uh, I don't think it would be horrendous. So tell you what, I'm going to get all these cover plates off and we're going to clean this thing up just so I kind of have an idea what I've, what I've got going on here. Looks like it has a new alternator on it. So why isn't it charging? Oh, huh. gee, I wonder. Looks like some uh, homemade bracket here, but there's no bolt underneath. That might be all it needs. Maybe they put it in and it fell out. Yeah, we'll put a new one in and Loctite that sucker. All right, so I've been looking this thing over a little bit. I see a little bit of a fuel leak um, from the pump. Gonna need to see how bad that is. I don't see a lot underneath it, so it might not be that big of a deal. This fuel line here, that can't be the main fuel line from the tank, that's too small. But it goes to the bottom of the primer pump. It looks like it broke and they welded it. See that right there? Doesn't seem to be leaking. I mean, there's no fuel on that. Fuel filter, engine oil filter, gonna need to change both of those. <laughs> Our alternator that isn't charging for some reason. Oh, this, uh, the exhaust. This is actually pretty solid, but it's got a hole right there, and obviously this is a, a mess. So I'll probably weld something new onto that. The rest of the exhaust manifold actually looks pretty good, and I don't see any evidence of exhaust leaks around it. The radiator is a mess. Look at that. I need to clean that up. The good news is about the radiator is it's full of coolant and has been since I bought it. And there's no evidence of leaking and it hasn't dropped. So that's good. Wipe this down a little bit. Get some of that uh, lovely stuff out of there. So the first thing I want to see is what this is doing if it's just slipping on the belt. And then I also want to see if this fuel line is leaking. Can you guys see that? Right there. There you can see what I mean, you have to hold that throttle or it, it just won't stay put. leaking. I see it right there. It actually looks like it's coming out of this fitting here. I wonder if that's just loose. Well, that was a nice time for that camera to die. Oh yeah, that fitting's loose.
I'm going to go ahead and put that thing up again. It'll be easier to tighten that too. I think I just had a loose uh, fitting here, which, uh, boy, that couldn't be any better. I'll take that any day and twice on Sunday. Now if I can just get a wrench on the darn thing. This is not enough room to get this thing because it hits the pump above it. And um, it definitely needs to be tightened more than it is. So I have this wrench. This is one I've had for many, many years before I even bought this farm. So, and this I used for doing hitches. I never use it anymore. So I'm gonna turn this into a flare nut wrench and hopefully it will be able to stand up to the force. So I can slide it over that, get it on there and tighten that thing up. What do you think, is that gonna work? Worth a try. Oh yeah, there we go. That's tight. That ought to do her. But I don't think that leaked. I guess I'll have to review the footage and see. Now this guy here is definitely leaking. Accumulated a nice little puddle here. Well, I think I discovered what's wrong with the alternator. That lead isn't hooked up. I think I can't really see it that well, but I'm pretty sure it's, yeah, I mean, it's only got one connection right now. And if it's relying on its connection to ground through the frame, it doesn't have a very good one because it's barely even on there. Can you see that? That terminal right there. I believe it's supposed to go to that. My gut's telling me this is not the original alternator. What do you think? Obviously it's not the original, but this isn't the style of alternator that originally came on here. Yeah, I'm gonna get this off of here so I can clean this up. This is one thing that I would not wanna be power washing. You know, looking at this thing, I think they had it on upside down. Yeah, that thing's bent this way. So if I bend it back, it'll match up with that. And then a bolt will go through here and actually hold that. The wires might need to be a little longer. So we'll extend that out and hook it up and do this thing right when we, uh, when we get to that point. I do a bench test of the alternator and in spite of spinning it quite fast, I find I only get 2.4 volts out of it. Turns out that I have something to learn about alternators, uh, and we'll talk about that later. I mean, it's putting out voltage. I'm probably not spinning it fast enough. Yeah, we just need to go get it hooked up right. But I'm gonna get this thing cleaned up before we do that. Close your eyes, hold your breath. All right, I'm willing to bet this has not been done in a long time, 20 years.
So this piece is cracked, but it's just a piece of plastic. And the tape is also cracked, but I think Gorilla Tape will fix that up just fine. The engine oil pressure works. I'm not sure about the water temperature and the transmission temperature, but maybe I didn't run it long enough. We'll check those later. Obviously the hour meter does not work, but <laughs> since I don't know where I'm starting, I don't really, well, I guess I ought to try to hook that up just for maintenance. All right, let's see what's going on with our air filter. There should be two filters in here. Doesn't look horrible. I think it could stand to be replaced though. That one certainly looks better. All right, I've got some new air filters on order. I'll clean these out and we'll use these until I get them. Barely anything came out of that one. This is the crankcase breather and it's all cracked. It has definitely seen better days, so I've got one of those on order. I didn't expect that thing to come out in two halves. That sure makes it easy. See, I guess this is like a mixture of dirt and grease that's just really caked on. And uh, it's, in the, it's in the radiator fins. So I wanna get all that out of there so this thing can cool properly. So this took a while. I used a pick and it was a combination of picking stuff out and also straightening out the radiator fins. Well, it looks good from far, but it's far from good. No, it, it's a lot better. And uh, that will certainly cool a lot better than it did. Oh, I see why they did what they did. <laughs> the pulleys don't line up. Not even close. What a rig. You can see looking down those pulleys, they do not line up. The alternator pulley uh, needs to come out to like there. Then it doesn't work on that bracket. These two plates right here that make the bracket are just bolted on there and, you know, just a nut on the other side. It couldn't be any more simple. You know, I could take that off and maybe make a spacer and move this bracket out. It actually needs to go out exactly an inch and then the alternator would go on there and then I could make another spacer on this side. I could probably make that work. It'd be a fair amount of work. Um, this isn't the right alternator and I'd rather not change the machine. I'd rather change the alternator. So the other thing that I could do is cut a slot right there in the bottom of that alternator. Could weaken it a little bit, but there's still plenty of meat there. And then it would just slot right in there where I want it to go. And then the bolt would go through. It wouldn't be able to move back and forth. And then of course it'll be secured at the top on that guy. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work. And, uh, this being obviously a cheapo alternator that I don't even know for sure. I think it's going to work, but I don't know for sure that it will. That's what I'm thinking. Let's just cut a slot in here. Couple more things I want to do before I start. One, I want to try to protect chips from getting inside this thing. And then I'm going to put a hole down on it. Okay, is that going to work?
Now, if I measured right, that should do it. So I am having to file just a little bit, using a round file to give the bottom a nice radius. Very nice. <clears throat> that feels pretty solid. I think that may work. So I guess at this point I really ought to test it and see if this thing's even gonna work before I keep uh, working on doing the wiring and everything. So I'm hooked to the positive, which is hooked to the battery, and I'm also hooked to the negative. So I'm reading the 12.6. We start it up, hopefully it's gonna be higher. So I'm doing the glow plugs now, so you can see a voltage drop. That's not making a lot of sense to me. It's an alternator. You can't spin it the wrong way. Let me disconnect the battery from this thing so that it's isolated and we'll see what kind of voltage we get. Now, this thing just, uh, where was it in there? Just came out, yeah, like this. So, let's pull that off of there and bring it in the shop. See if we can figure anything out. Oh goody. <laughs> that style of brush, so that it's like almost impossible to put back together. What do we got here? So this alternator had me scratching my head. I opened it up and I checked the internal components to see if I could see anything wrong. Checked the slip rings, checked the windings at the stator and capacitor, resistor. They all seemed reasonable. All right, this may have been user error. This is a one wire alternator. I've never come across that before. Yeah, I think I was just measuring the voltage wrong. Maybe, I don't know. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it back together and we'll see what it does. All that said, this post here was loose when I first started working on it, and that's the main battery connection, so that could have been the problem. And I did have to open it up in order to fix this. I put Loctite on it and screw it back in place, so got a good connection there now. Now getting the rotor back in place with this style of brushes is always tricky. You have to get the brushes which are spring-loaded in place and then retain them somehow put the rotor in, and then release the brushes so that they can ride against the slip rings. Okay, and now you need to stick something down through that hole to retain it. So I'm gonna use this piece of wire, because it's gotta be something that you can pull out after you've installed the, the rotor. We got one of them done, and now without messing that up, I get to do the second one. This'll be fun. Ten years later. Once I get the rotor in, I will be able to just pull that wire out and the brushes will spring against these slip rings. Alright, so I've got my wire going straight up here. I am going to thread it through this housing.
there. So now the rotor's in place, so I can pull that out and the brushes are now in place. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on with these one wires. It's not just positive and negative. The negative is the case. That's the positive. Um, but I was reading that it needs a battery connection, I guess, to excite it. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, let's go put it on. We'll hook the battery to it and bolt it on. So we'll have the ground on the frame. Yeah, let's see what we get. All right, we are connected. That goes to the battery. This does need to run to F according to wiring diagrams that I found, but nothing else is hooked up. It's bolted to the frame. It's also bolted here and should have a, a good ground connection. Well, it took me a little while, but I got there. Yeah, I really kind of took the, <laughs> the scenic route on that one, didn't I? Well, just because I was testing that thing wrong. It turns out it's because it wasn't bolted to the frame is the reason it wasn't charging at first. Because the belt was still spinning. Although it was still bolted on the top, so you would think it would have a ground connection there. Maybe it was the battery post. I don't know. It works now. I'm done poking this bear. world is the purpose of that? I mean, <laughs> it's not an armrest. Seems like a good way to make your tank rust out. Basics of a dozer. You got your blade up front. You got your tracks. What's driving everything? So, Engine, obviously, no big deal. That comes back. There is a transmission with a torque converter in it. And then that has a drive shaft coming out of it. Goes to what they call the bevel gear, which amounts to basically a rear differential. And then on the side of the bevel gear, both sides, there are steering clutches. And these clutches are what you're controlling with the foot pedals to engage and disengage. After the steering clutches, there are final drives, and that is basically a planetary gear set that uh, then drives the sprockets. How's that for a sprocket? So we've got engine oil, we've got transmission oil, we've got bevel, bevel gear oil, and we've got final drive oil on both sides. Uh, obviously there's also coolant, and there's a hydraulic system, so there's a hydraulic oil tank. And incidentally, whenever you buy an old dozer like this, man, you can't help but take a gamble. There's just no way around it. If any one of these parts fails, you are in for some serious money just to get the parts. Obviously, the engine uh, the engine actually would probably be one of the cheaper things, um, surprisingly. Transmission, you know, you might get lucky and find a used one, but that's going to be tough. These steering clutches... <laughs> You're talking many, many thousands of dollars if those need to be replaced. Same with the final drives. Yeah, any number of things in an old dozer that breaks can total it. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of things. And I guess that's why the things are so darn expensive. When they're, when they're operational, I think I priced it from CAT. The steering clutches for this machine are like 15 grand just to buy the parts. Now, you can get aftermarket parts for probably half of that. That's why you often find these listings where they're selling a dozer at scrap price, even if it runs, because it needs new steering clutches. Basically, you're going to be 15000 into it before you can blink. Yeah, I don't know. Did I pay too much? Still not sure. All right, so here under the seat, we have this one, which goes forward. That's the transmission oil. And it looks good, and it's full. And then this is the bevel gear oil. And it also looks good and it's full. I think somebody did a full maintenance or what they thought was a full maintenance on it before they got rid of it. These oils look like they've recently been changed to me, but I don't know that for sure. It can be hard to tell. And I don't know if they put the right stuff in. So yeah, I'm gonna end up changing all the oil and everything in there in here. While we're checking fluids, let's check the engine oil. I checked these when I bought it, of course. See, 
it's full and it's a little black but for a diesel not too bad uh, I'm, I'm gonna change it anyway but you know what the thing that I like I've checked both final drives the bevel gear the transmission and the engine oil and I've looked in the hydraulic oil and nothing has water in it so there's that so I'll tell you one thing I've noticed on this machine the batteries under here and a big wire goes forward to the starter and here's the control panel but there's no fuses to be seen anywhere i've looked it over really well no fuses that's a concern of course because if one of these wires is hot and it shorts to the frame because obviously the insulation is old you know you may end up it'll ruin your battery but you'll also end up with uh, possibly a fire and uh, we don't want that. Before I add a fuse to this thing, I want to look behind here. All the electrics converge on this panel, and there might be some fuses behind here. Well, at least all swarm of wasps haven't come out yet. Wow. <laughs> That's nice looking, isn't it? Mud daubers. They're like Wasp Central. Plus a mouse. Anybody home? I don't think anybody's home. Looks like a great way to start a fire, doesn't it? Pack that in all around a bunch of electrical stuff. What could go wrong? Close your eyes. Okay, there's hope here. So this is the power wire that is coming from the, well, the starter. But essentially, this is the main incoming power to everything except the starter. And it goes directly to this, which I believe is a circuit breaker. On the other side, there's this little button, which would be the reset button. So, uh, I just need to make sure that that breaker works. That wire is in this most of the time, and I'm okay with that, because if the breaker works, then that would protect it. But out here, I can see the wire right there. I can see it right there. So I think I just need to get some protection on that. So I disconnected the battery. So this is the this is a direct connection to the battery. No fuse on that one. All right, and this is the main power that goes to that breaker. So I just need to connect, uh, protect that eight inches there. Got a nice little sheath here. I feel better about that. Now we have pretty well protected wire up into the breaker. All right. All right, one sketchy farmer test. I just want to see if this breaker is going to trip. This is 150 amps. So, um, and you know, the last time I did this, people said the battery was going to blow up. It's not going to blow up with 150 amps. It's going to put out a lot more than that, just starting the engine. Um, cold cranking amps on a battery is like 800. The wire that comes from the starter, so the main input power from everything except the starter, goes to the breaker, comes out of the breaker, comes to this, my 150 amps breaker, and then there's a good ground. So I'm going to short it. And uh, we're going to see if that breaker pops. And I believe it did. Let me see here. Yep, no more juice. And hopefully that didn't ruin that breaker. Oh, I think it just reset. So I should have voltage on this again. 
Yep, 12 and a half volts. Okay. So the breaker works. Very good. I'm trying to get this hour meter sorted out. This is the hour meter here. So the first thing I want to do is just go hook this straight to 12 volts and see if it works. This is the positive side. So that's negative. This is positive. Let's see if it works. Yes. Here. Yeah, here it counting and see the clicker over there. So the hour meter works. It's just not getting power. So here's the wire that we already fixed up. This comes straight from the starter. It goes down here to the breaker, comes out of the breaker. Over here, this is the amp meter. So then this is becomes sort of the positive battery bus. Everything goes through the breaker and then the amp meter and then here. So this wire right here is sending power over to this, which is the engine oil pressure uh, switch. The sensor works, or at least it seems to. This is the sensor. So, and that's actually, I think, I think that's a tube sending pressure, the actual oil pressure up here to the gauge. But this is supposed to be an electrical switch. When the pressure is there, it makes a connection here, and it, and it does not seem to be. So, uh, I get the 12 volts here. I don't get anything on the other side, even when the engine's running. I'm going to clean those connections up, and we'll look at it again and see if it gets any better. Uh, I'll let you know what I find. So the pressure gauge is working. I'm not getting an electrical connection between these two points. So this thing right here is not working. Let's take it off. You can actually see the engine oil there. So this thing is crimped on. Man, it would be nice if that would unscrew and I could get inside. I probably just need to clean the contacts. I have successfully uncrimped things and then carefully pounded them back together and gotten away with it. But I think what I'm going to do first is just uh, do some compressed air in there. All right, so it took a little while, but I did come up with a series of connections that would allow me to hook it to a little hand pump. And now I've got my electrical meter set to continuity on the two leads to see if I can make any connection. And the answer is, you know, 70 PSI is about the most you'd see out of oil pressure. And I got nothing, even if I go a little higher. There's nothing. So I'm probably going to need to buy a new one of those. But first, I think I will see if I can rip it open. Why not? So this looks like it's gotten hot. I guess if the electrical connection started arcing, that would be the only source of heat. But uh, it also looks like this, this, I guess, plunger has melted. Yeah, see, it's... And when I pull it all the way out, it doesn't... Uh, I don't think it was able to push on this anymore. And that just needs to be pushed to make a connection between this post right there and this post right there. While I would love to um, try to rig this up and fix it, I don't think it's going to be a reasonable thing to, to do. Mainly because, say I remake this part and I get it the right length, which is very hard to know. How long does it need to be? Because the amount of travel that it has is only going to be maybe, maybe an eighth of an inch. Probably not even that much. The other issue is, is this thing can't leak. Engine oil pressure is pushing right here. And if this leaks, I'm going to be dripping oil out of my engine into the into the console. Especially if I didn't notice it, that could be a real big problem because now you're, you've got a uh, low engine oil situation. Not only are you making a mess in your console. So let me go price what a new one of these is. I bet you I can just get anything. Certainly don't need a cat part for that. So I ordered a new seal for that. Ten bucks. 
And then I ordered a new uh, oil pressure switch, uh, 13 bucks. So another thing this machine is missing, uh, there's supposed to be, like you can see, there's bolts here for guards that kind of keep the dirt off of everything and under here. And this thing's gonna constantly be just clog clogging up with mud and dirt when I use it. I don't even want to check the price of having those replaced from the dealer, so I'll be on the lookout for a used set. But uh, if anybody has, you know, this is a 1975 D3. Uh, if you have anything like that and willing to sell it for a reasonable price, let me know. All right, I got my new oil pressure switch. This is the hour meter going back in. That's positive. That's negative. So this wire was for the old style alternator that we're not using anymore. So I'm just gonna leave that disconnected. It's not connected on the other end either. Interesting how this thing works. I was wondering because there really isn't like an ignition switch. This key engages the starter. It doesn't, in the glow plugs, that's it. It doesn't do anything else. So there's nothing to control like, when does the hour meter run? Well, it's the oil pressure switch. It'll run because this is a constant power supply that's directly to the battery to here. Anytime this makes the connection, in other words, the engine's running, there's oil pressure, then the hour meter is going to be running. One. Likes glow plugs. It only takes like 20 seconds. Oh, actually, I can hear the hour meter because that made enough oil pressure to overcome that switch. So it works. clock is running. As the pressure drops off, that should stop. And that did it. Nice. I actually did get the seal for this uh, governor control shaft right here. So let's work on putting that on. That looks like a farmer was here before. Lose that key. There she's moving. Right into the black hole. It's just a little bit of scotch bright. That look like the right part to you? Looks good to me. Slide hammer. Ah, just 
yanking the screw out of there. I'm gonna try it again with a smaller bit. the side of that unfortunately but I also don't think it's gonna hit where the seal is I think I'm okay there the sealing surface is just deep to that so I just want to make sure I drive this new seal all the way in a little bit of grease see how that does. First try. Well, I hate to do it guys, but I'm gonna have to break this into multiple videos. Uh, there's just way too much to do and there's no way I can cut it all the way down into one video. What I'm getting ready to do now is change all the fluids, but I need to take this thing out for a ride, get the engine oil and all the transmission oil and everything stirred up, warmed up, and then we'll drain it all out. Continue on with getting this thing back into operating condition. I've got a really cool job coming up that I think you guys are gonna like to see that I'm gonna be using this on as well as my excavator and my dump truck. It's a big job that I'm kind of excited about, something I've never done before, but I'm gonna leave you guys in suspense on exactly what that is. Maybe make some guesses down in the comments. We'll see you back next week, continue on this beast, but before we go, uh, let's take this thing out for a ride and uh, let you see my first experience operating a dozer pushing around some dirt. <laughs>